Funding for the production of Folks is provided in part by the Friends of LPB. What are officials at Fisk University doing to solve their current financial problems? An attempt will be made to raise money to pay some of the large debts which have uh, been hanging over our heads for the past uh, several years. And what are alumni and friends of the university around the country doing to help? They're thinking up all kinds of creative uh, types of entertainment and uh, uh, having the proceeds sent to Fisk. Hello everyone, I'm Rob Hinton. And I'm Genevieve Stewart. Today on Folks, we are visiting Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee. We are here attending the Black Family Summit sponsored by the NAACP and the National Urban League. And we thought that while we were here, we would share with you some of the rich and proud history of Fisk University, one of this nation's leading black colleges for more than a century now. In addition to the history, we're going to tell you about the university's current financial problems and what's being done to ease them. A look at Fisk University today on Folks. The story of the founding of Fisk University is indeed a dramatic one. Fiction could not provide more fascinating reading. The setting is 1865, following the Civil War. At the advent of the Reconstruction period, the Freedmen's Bureau and the American Missionary Association asked highly qualified white abolitionist educators to establish learning centers in the South for Negroes. Erastus Milo Cravath was directed to establish such a college in Nashville. This is why you built a library here. You built one in Washington and you built one in Atlanta uh, because these were the big, great centers for one Negro education in the South. But Funds were allocated to purchase land for Nashville's great center of education, where this Civil War hospital barracks still stands. It was Fisk's first school building, now a National Historic Landmark, as are most of the campus buildings. Additional funds needed for the fledgling school were donated by General Clinton B. Fisk, because of General Fisk's continued interest, the new Freedmen's School bears his name. On January 6, 1866, Fisk University was opened. Within four months, 1,000 students ages 7 to 70, parents and children were attending day and evening sessions to pursue their thirst for knowledge. Even though the next 50 years were marked by growth and academic excellence, the university was still in financial need, as Dr. John Cotin remembers when he joined the faculty in 1927. But I came without whether there be a salary or not. But by the time I got here, money had been raised, and so I was paid $1,800 a, a year. So I was paid a salary. But insofar as the contract amount, I came without a salary, but I got here, the salary had been raised. In examining the contribution of Fisk University alumni to black culture, it is also an impressive look at formidable leaders who shaped United States history. The founders of both the National NAACP and Urban League were Fisk graduates. Fisk's most famous alumnus is W.E.B. Du Bois, author, historian, and founder of the NAACP. His posture as a civil rights leader was begun at Fisk. While pursuing graduate studies at Harvard University in 1889, Du Bois stated, that he found no better teachers than at Fisk, only teachers better known. Even then, it was the dedicated faculty and motivated students who established Fisk's reputation. No pavement, no light, and no nothing on the campus. But it was the spirit of the thing that you got when you got here, and you saw the need, because most of the people here, more or less, were the missionary type of people 
who were here for, say, this now, for Ms. Essence, Ms. Cation, and Ms. Scribner, uh, were, had stayed on. There was $1,000 left in the budget, and they needed English teachers. And Ms. Scribner and Ms. Cation stayed and divided that $1,000 so the English department could go on. Sociologist and author Dr. George Edmund Haynes graduated in 1903. His extensive studies in economics eventuated in founding the National Urban League. And later joining the faculty, Haynes instituted the first black history course taught at any college in the United States. This pattern of achievement was continued by countless alumni. Among them, noted historian Dr. Charles Wesley, who became president of Wilberforce and Central State Universities in Ohio. Dr. John Hope Franklin is currently recognized as one of the country's foremost authorities in history. The first black to hold a congressional seat since Reconstruction was alumnus William Dawson. He was later joined by Fiskite Charles Diggs. At a time 30 years ago when the United States had only three black congressmen, two of them were Fisk graduates. During the 1930s and 40s, Fisk University's reputation was further enhanced as the focal point of research on black culture. It was a think tank for scholars and a haven for intellectual artists. The pulse of the great Negro Renaissance shifted from Harlem to Fisk, where the voices of the Harlem Renaissance could be heard for many years. We were exposed to all of the people that were doing things in this country at that time and had an opportunity to have one-on-one -on -one experiences with them. And then the people that I went to school with became people who've had an impact on this country in later years. These years were greatly influenced by Dr. Charles Johnson, who served as FISC president and a veritable magnet to attract a faculty roster that reads like who's who in black history. In a 12-year period under Johnson, FISC published 40 books that were destined to have an important impact on how the government perceived black problems and influenced President Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal legislation, pictured here as he visited the campus in 1934. Faculty members included E. Franklin Frazier, James Weldon Johnson, who wrote God's Trombones and Lift Every Voice, the National Black Anthem, and Arna Bontaw. Bontaw, upon joining Fisk faculty, encouraged more of his associates from the Harlem Renaissance to join him at Fisk, while collaborating on now famous plays, movie screenplays, poems, and historical documents. Dr. Roberta Tyson was a student of Bontaw's. Uh, during that time, he was working on several things that he has since been um, the hundred years of Negro freedom he was he and Langston Hughes were working on at the time and that is another person that I came into contact with at a very early point in my life um, and it just kind of it gives a different feeling to pick up something uh, that someone has written and know that that you've known this person and you've you've worked with them County Cullen, Sterling Brown, and Langston Hughes, pictured here with Bonton, left their mark on Fisk students. Harlem Renaissance artist Aaron Douglas was persuaded to join the faculty after painting his now famous murals on the walls of Cravath Hall, which depicted the ravages of slavery. Going there in the 50s, coming from Louisiana, I, it was during a time that one was apologetic for being black. So another thing that I gained was immediately a kind of pride that I never had been exposed to before. Everywhere you looked, you, you were made aware of the contributions that blacks had made to this country. In 1928, the annual Festival of the Arts was begun. Originator of the blues, W.C. Handy, was an early participant. This library houses his manuscripts, among many others. More recently, highly acclaimed arts festival participants have been Quincy Jones, Cecily Tyson, Sidney Poitier, Harry Belafonte, and pictured here, Stevie Wonder and Eubie Blake. Wonder and Blake were awarded honorary degrees. Wonder stated it was the highlight of his career to share the podium at Fisk with his idol, Eubie Blake. It exposed you to such a wealth of, of, of great thinkers and minds and scholars. You know, it overwhelms me when I think of the, the minds, uh, the people that came by Fisk to give lectures and so forth that were of, of national prominence. And they were just there. You could just go and listen to them and, and get into rap sessions afterwards. And, and you sort of take that situation for granted when it's, when it's offered to you in such, uh, such a volume. And uh, I think all that rubs off on you sometimes without you realizing it. 
1967 Fisk graduate and award-winning poet Nikki Giovanni has been a frequent guest lecturer, as was author John O. Killens. You aren't only encouraged to aspire to earn a good living, but to live a good life. Fisk University has been first on many fronts. It was the first historically black college to be granted a chapter of both Phi Beta Kappa and Mortar Board. It was the first college in the United States to send 90% of its alumni to graduate schools. The research for the Supreme Court landmark case, Brown versus Board of Education, which desegregated United States schools, was conducted on the campus of Fisk University. During that time, Thurgood Marshall was a constant visitor and conferee. And the research for the first public housing projects in the United States was also conducted on the campus. The first public housing project in the United States was constructed near the campus as a monument to that research. Fisk is first in the minds of scholars, first in the creative souls of artists, and certainly first and foremost in the hearts of its friends around the United States who are rallying to support this irreplaceable national treasure, Fisk University. One can hardly talk about the history of Fisk University without mentioning the Jubilee Singers. The group originated back in 1871. It was a chorus of nine young men and women who toured the country in an attempt to raise money for the university, which was then on the verge of financial collapse. The Jubilee Singers electrified audiences everywhere. In 1873, the group toured England and gave a command performance before Queen Victoria. Edmund Havel, an artist in the court of Queen Victoria, painted this portrait of the celebrated singers. The financial successes of the Jubilee Singers' tours in this country and Europe led to the construction of Jubilee Hall in 1875, a structure sometimes lovingly called Frozen Music, a memorial to the songs that were its building. The Jubilee Singers became ambassadors at large for Fisk University and Black America, a role that even the Jubilee Singers of today still play. I got a harp up in the kingdom, ain't a that good Despite the proud heritage here at Fisk, the university has never been immune to money problems. At the beginning of the 1983-84 school year, the money situation developed into a crisis. You see, the local gas company refused to turn on the heat until a $177,000 gas bill had been paid. The gas was turned off in April of 1983. 
But it wasn't until last fall when the weather turned cooler that any action was taken to restore gas to heat the dorms and classrooms. The student government, sororities, fraternities, and other campus groups started a fundraising drive and took the campaign to the streets of Nashville. Many people have known that Fisk and other historically black colleges have always been in the red. So it wasn't something new. It's just that the severity of this problem came to light during the fall of 1983. One of the main things that we did during that fall in the month of November, directly after our homecoming, was to have a day entitled Tag Day, which students went out into the community and solicited funds from local Nashvilleans. And this was sponsored through the Student Government Association, but it, through the help of our Chicago Alumni Association, which helped funded part of the project. And through that, in an eight hour, through that, through those efforts, within an eight hour period, we were able to raise 4000 a little over $4,000. A local newspaper and a local television station also got together and conducted a street campaign. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Meharry Medical College also did its part by asking its students to dig into their pockets and put money into collection plates to help Fisk out. I'm hesitating to call it a collection, but that's what it is. <laughs> We're going to take up a collection here today. I know some of you have given. Uh, some of you probably gave Sunday at church. I know I did, but I'm going to give again. The heating bill wasn't the university's only financial problem. Last November, Fisk began negotiating with the Internal Revenue Service on how it could pay $500,000 in back taxes. At the peak of its financial health in 1968, Fisk University had an endowment totaling more than $14.5 million. So what happened? Lamar Edwards, a Fisk graduate and the newly appointed Director of Development, shares his thoughts. Well, uh, for one thing, Fisk did not maintain a fundraising capability like it should. Back in 1968, we had a full staff. Of course, we had some money from the Ford Foundation, $800,000 over a four-year period. And with that money, a full comp complement of development personnel, development types was hired. Fisk was the only black school, and I believe it's still the only black school, to have a full-time deferred giving person that had a uh, one of the best fundraising capabilities at that time in the country, and it just dwindled, it just died. And everything going out and nothing coming in leaves nothing. Uh, I think that when we do, and right now the staff is depleted. Uh, as I said, I just came back a month ago, and right now I'm the only, quote, fundraiser on campus. Uh, we've got to replenish the staff in the first place. And then uh, we have to go out and tell the fist story and convince people that this is the cause that they want to support rather than a million others they could support. But nobody's going to bring the money to us. We have to go and get it. And we have to have competent staff to do that. Not only did the students and local community come to Fisk Rescue, so did alumni and friends. Some of them have been giving different types of entertainment. Uh, to give an example, uh, here in Nashville, uh, a group came in and had a, uh, a concert uh, with Ramsey Lewis and um, Bill Cosby. And around the country, people are having dances, uh, uh, plays uh, to which they charge admission. Uh, they have in their teas and coffee groups and the Morehouse group came here, uh, their glee club, and had a concert here about a month ago with the proceeds uh, to go to Fisk. Uh, they're thinking up all kinds of creative uh, types of entertainment and uh, having the proceeds sent to Fisk. There is also hope that the Reagan administration's task force looking at black colleges might mean some financial relief for Fisk. And that task force was here about two weeks ago and spent several days on campus and off campus, several meetings. And I have not seen the official report, but all indications that I received from uh, our interim president and so forth seem to point that they are very optimistic as to uh, the future of FISC. 
And the Board of Trustees at Fisk is trying to set up a development program that will raise the endowment at Fisk to at least $20 million. It is called a long step forward, and it consists of uh, three phases. Uh, the first phase uh, is an attempt to raise money that would take care of present operating expenses. The second phase uh, would be a uh, slightly longer phase, uh, during which time an attempt will be made to raise money to pay some of the large debts which have uh, been hanging over our heads for the past uh, several years. And then the final phase, of course, would be the longest of the three phases, and that would be to, uh, to attempt to, to uh, increase the endowment. And uh, indeed, we are speaking about maybe $20 million a, a, a total of the three phases. The largest portion of that would probably be the last phase, which would be about $15 million. The president of Fisk, when the university's finances developed into a crisis, was Walter Leonard. But he resigned last fall, and now the search is on for a new president. Still, with its financial problems and declining enrollment, 1600 in 1972 to 695 in 1984, Fisk University is a college that the students, alumni, and staff are proud of. Personally, I love it. Uh, it's the type of education that I received here. It's a lot different than the kind that I received back in, in, my, in my high school. Um, it's close-knit. We call ourselves the Fisk family, and in a lot of ways we are. It's a low um, student ratio between the student and the faculty. You know your teachers, and your teachers know you. And not only that, it's a type of respect that we have for our faculty members, which adds on to why it's such an academically sound university. Fisk is an institution which is bigger than any one person, uh, bigger than any one administration, any one student, any, any one alumnus of the, of the university. Uh, it is a spirit of learning and a spirit of knowledge, a spirit, a spirit of high ideals, uh, a spirit of quality. So what can people do to help Fisk? The first, of course, is money. I think that alumni and non-alumni uh, uh, should contribute. I think very frequently uh, uh, people are, are of the opinion that unless they have thousands of dollars to give, it doesn't really count. And of course, that's not so at all. All gifts uh, 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 are appreciated and mean a great deal to the university. So I, I would say the first thing, of course, is to give of your funds as well as to help raise funds. And I think second to that would be uh, assisting to recruit good students to Santa Fisk. I think uh, the alumni and the non-alumni need to encourage bright youngsters to uh, select Fisk as the school of their choice. So I would say send us money and send us good students. And what do Fiskites, both past and present, see in the future for their university? It is true that if you're short of money, sometimes labs are short. It is true that if you're short of money, sometimes a building that is in disrepair can't be repaired in a timely fashion. But it is a fact that we have met all of the academic requirements and have seen to that. It has meant that, for the most part, we've had to stretch a little bit. But we have to remain loyal to the catalog and to the academic history of the institution. Now, uh, in, in, in any realistic sense, we know that we can't keep doing this. We have to make up ground. The, the physical plant side must catch up with us in the academic side. But we intend to remain the, the focus, the beacon to which every other piece of the institution must strive for we must maintain academic excellence. In many ways, I'd like to see FIS grow a little bit more than it is right now, not only as far as of on this university campus, but grow to be an integral part of the Nashville community and also be an integral part of Tennessee. Because FIS, most FISCites here do, are not originally from Nashville or from Tennessee. Most FISCites are from anywhere but Tennessee, as we always put, put it. But I'd like to see FIST become an integral part of the community because we have a lot of things to share, and the community has a lot of things to share with us also. Uh, I, I think that FISC is going to uh, probably be uh, a small college of about maybe, say, 12 or 1,500 students. I think it's going to be uh, mainly a liberal arts college, as it, as it has been for many years. Uh, I think it's uh, going to have a very high level of excellence in terms of its academic program. 
and I think it's going to have, uh, the buildings are going to be in good repair, and I think there may be some new buildings, a science building and a fine arts building. And I think there might be a closer relationship in the future maybe between Fisk and Meharry. I certainly think this is something to be encouraged. Uh, I think that uh, there's so many programs uh, uh, which can be joint ventures, pre-medical program at Fisk where students almost automatically go to Meharry after they've completed the pre-medical work. The same thing in dentistry and so forth. So I think that uh, I, I foresee a closer relationship between the two schools, not just geographic as they've been for many years, but as far as programs and so forth are concerned, I see a much closer relationship. You can quote me as your last sentence, Fisk is going to be all right. That's our program on Fisk University. Thanks for watching. We'll be back right here at Fisk next week with highlights from the Black Family Summit sponsored by the NAACP and the National Urban League. And we hope you'll join us then. Until that time, make it a good week. Funding for the production of Folks is provided in part by the Friends of LPB.